We go to the strip of the Pacific Ocean. It's off the Central American coast. This can have a big impact on weather. It's climate pattern that can impact what actually happens. El Nino can strengthen the subtropical jet. That brings wet conditions into the southern U.S., but it also could bring colder and drier conditions into the Northeast. Right now, that area in the Pacific, very warm. El Nino is about uh, the El Nino 3 region. If you look at this, you'll be able to see the region that you mark 3. Um, right there, that is a degree and a half warmer than average, and that's considered moving into a strong El Nino. There are signs that it stays that way right through the winter. How does that give us a boost? Uh, Stephen, when you look at this, and we could be going into what they call super El Nino. I feel like the El Ninos are all becoming super at this point. Yeah. But um, how does this play out for us in the Northeast? And, and you look at the bigger pattern of a super El Nino. I'll hit it off here. It's complicated. Right. What, we, what we deal with with this overall evolution, I mean, we look at what's going on in the equatorial Pacific, and it's like, okay, what's going to happen in, say, the Northeast? or in the southern tier. There are other oscillations uh, around the globe, too. We've got the Arctic Oscillation and others in the Pacific and in the Atlantic both. The AO is a big dictator of, of where we deal with the coldest of, of the air. That will, will provide a big response to how cool will it get and, and more or less focusing on the polar jet. But there's something that's interesting that's occurring known as a westerly wind burst. When we look and focus more so in the equatorial Pacific again, sometimes these phenomenons occur, and that's, Amy, what would push what would be just a, a strong El Nino to maybe a super El Nino. And what occurs is something called downwelling, basically where we have the warmer waters in this region of the Pacific, they are pushed eastward a little closer to the western coast of South America. And that would tremendously perhaps affect what we might see with our overall weather pattern as we head toward winter. But a westerly wind burst is something that has been noted, and that oftentimes downstream leads to even more warming. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation. When I try to tell people about El Nino, I say, think of a body of water and the surface is warm. Mm -hmm. um, small waves, tiny waves in the Pacific Ocean, just teeny tiny ones, keep that warmth trapped right there at the surface. And if you jump into a body of water, you feel the warmth at the surface, and then you're, you go deeper down, it gets colder. That's a simple explanation of El Nino, what's happening there, but it's a large pattern. So mm -hmm. if you get a westerly wind there that's helping to keep that all stable and maybe push um, some of that heat further down, that could strengthen the impacts that we see. So what they're looking for to get into the super El Nino definity, like the definition here, is you want to get into two degrees above the average sea surface temperature, and that's when it would be considered uh, the Super El Nino. Wow, this is pretty incredible. This came from NASA's flight center um, where they're tracking and all this these was, temperatures. This was one of the strongest El Ninos on record. This was back from 2015 to 2016. In fact, for, for references and for study and research, 2015 and 2016 were significant years because that's when we saw the effects of a super El Nino. And again, it was that warming right off the coast of South America. So when you start to look at this, um, this is something you could do on your own. If you take 2015 and 2016, that, that year, that winter, and correlate it to your region, what happened during your winter mm -hmm. during that El Nino pattern? And you might get a gauge on what the trend can do. So that's kind of an interesting way to create your own forecast for the winter, right? 2015, 2016, if you live in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, go ahead and go 2015, 2016, what happened that winter? And you might get a handle on at least what the pattern can do in those years. Now, El Nino's impacts influence a lot of different things across different regions. So we want to bring in a research scientist. Her name is Mary Beth Arcodia. She's from Colorado State University. First of all, Mary Beth, thanks for being on Fox Weather. Do we get the Super El Nino this year? It looks like it's getting close. Thank you so much for having me. So um, as you mentioned, we're currently in an El Nino. And we have about an 80% chance that this El Nino will peak as a strong event, meaning that the sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific will be above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, for this super El Nino, meaning the sea surface temperatures are above 2 degrees Celsius, we have about a 30% chance of that happening this winter. Well, it's pretty fascinating when you start to get the extremes on El Nino. Is there any new research that says when we get into a super phase of this pattern that it will impact us differently? We're just trying to figure out what's going to go down in a super El Nino winter in the Northeast. 
Yes, definitely. So um, when we have a strong El Nino event, these events are coupled to the atmosphere. And so we have these big circulating systems and these large storms. And these storms in the tropical Pacific can influence the jet stream that ultimately impacts the weather that we see in the United States. So when we have a stronger El Nino event, those storms and circulation patterns are typically stronger, meaning that this can have a larger influence on the jet stream and a larger influence on weather in the United States. So the global imprint from El Nino is typically stronger and more present when the El Nino event itself is stronger. Do you as scientists look back at previous, you know, El Nino, strong El Nino years like 2015, 2016, 97, 98, and try to draw those correlations? Can, can you learn something from looking back at what happened in those years actually in weather to help project, project or predict what is going to be going down over the winter months? Absolutely. It's one of the largest sources of information that we have to look back in historical data and then see what the downstream effects of those El Nino events are. And so um, there's only actually been four of these super El Ninos historically, 2015-16 being one of them. But it is really important to note that no two El Ninos are the same and definitely no two impacts from El Nino are the same. So we do use it to help make predictions for the winter time. But um, as was mentioned earlier, there's a lot of other climate factors going on, such as other climate modes of variability, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Arctic Oscillation were mentioned that have impacts on Northeast weather. And so we try to look at a holistic view of these El Nino impacts because we can use them to help make predictions, but the impact from El Nino is not always, the typical impact from El Nino is not always what we end up seeing. So it's more of a trend instead of a forecast. It's definitely, we use the forecast, but we uh, try, try to take in all of these pieces of our complex climate system to help make the best forecast that we can. It's fascinating. The ocean has so much influence over what's happening in the atmosphere. Thank you for joining us today to talk a little bit about El Nino. If it strengthens to two, let's bring you back so we can talk more and continue the conversation. Research scientist Mary Beth Arcodia from Colorado State University. I'm Amy Freeze. Welcome to Fox Weather's YouTube page. We have more great videos on the way, so make sure to subscribe to stay updated on all things weather.